World Trade Center 7 was a 47-story steel skyscraper that housed numerous government agencies, including the Securities and Exchange Commission and the CIA. It had some office fires, particularly on the SEC floors, where many key Enron and WorldCom files were lost. No other steel skyscraper has ever collapsed due to fire, yet remarkably, late on September 11th, it fell straight down at near free fall acceleration for almost 100 feet, even though no airplane ever hit it. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, was tasked with solving this most amazing collapse. One unique piece of steel was found by Professor Jonathan Barnett, a fire protection engineer. He found a one-inch thick steel column from World Trade Center 7 reduced to a half-inch thickness with gaping holes curled like a paper scroll thin to almost razor sharpness with a Swiss cheese appearance. And Professors Biederman and Sisson of Worcester Polytech confirmed the presence of eutectic formations on the steel. The Swiss cheese appearance shocked all of the Firewise professors, who expected to see distortion and bending, but not holes. And the New York Times called these findings perhaps the deepest mystery uncovered in the investigation. FEMA conducted a preliminary building performance study in 2002. In an Appendix C of their report, they mentioned the mysterious eutectic mixture that attacked this steel. The severe corrosion and subsequent erosion of the samples are a very unusual event. No clear explanation for the source of the sulfur has been identified. So what is a eutectic mixture? It's an alloy or mixture whose melting point is lower than that of any other alloy or mixture of the same ingredients. As the sulfur content of iron oxide increases, the melting point decreases. So the problem is, what is the source of the sulfur that causes steel to look like Swiss cheese? There are two primary theories. The mainstream explanation is that the source of the sulfur was from normal building materials found in the rubble. In 2006, Frank Greening prepared a report outlining potential sources of sulfur. Dr. Greening identified the following major potential sources of sulfur, gypsum wallboard, diesel fuel oil, and molten aluminum reactions with gypsum. Mainstream media, such as movies, have said the sulfur came from masses of gypsum wallboard that was pulverized and burned in the fires. But independent scientists have developed their own studies that suggest other sources for the sulfur in the eutectic mixture. Specifically, various incendiaries, including thermate, was a contributing cause of the intergranular melting. The main chemical reaction in thermate is the same as thermite, but it also contains sulfur. Sulfur generates a eutectic system when molten thermate interacts with iron or steel, lowering the melting point of iron. But scientists on both sides wanted NIST to address this critical evidence in their final World Trade Center 7 report. Professor Jones said NIST should do an easy experiment in the presence of gypsum and then test whether sulfur has entered the steel. And Dr. Greening wisely wrote at the end of his report, by way of verifying these conclusions, it is suggested that NIST fire tests should be repeated using more realistic environments that include shredded aluminum alloy 2024, crushed concrete and gypsum, water, rusted steel, aviation fuel, plastics, etc. And FEMA said, a detailed study into the mechanism of this phenomenon is needed to determine what risk, if any, is presented to existing steel structures exposed to severe and long-burning fires. And Ryan Mackey wrote, at the time of writing, NIST has not yet issued its report on WTC-7. It may and should address this issue in the final report. And even NIST said that their report would address all major recommendations contained in the FEMA report. Unfortunately, NIST did not address this issue in their WTC-7 final report, nor conduct any experiments as suggested by Dr. Greening to verify the gypsum board hypothesis. So how can we tell who is not correct? We need to conduct an experiment, the arbitrator of opposing hypothesis. I used a W12 by 50 wide flange beam, which has thinner flanges than the original steel used in WTC-7. Using my oxyacetylene torch, I cut two holes in the flange so I could lift the completed assembly. I then placed gypsum board on the top and bottom flanges and subdivided the space in the web with multiple thicknesses of gypsum board. 
Gypsum board was crushed, and on one side, dry chunks of gypsum was placed, while on the other side, gypsum that was soaked in a bucket of rainwater was used. Some concrete was crushed. And on the other side of the wide flange, a mixture of gypsum board, crushed concrete, and aluminum scraps, some from an airplane, steel scraps, and plastic was mixed in. About a gallon of diesel fuel was also added to the mix. A drywall lid with holes covered the side. And the entire setup was wrapped with wire lath and fence to help keep all the material contained in close to the wide flange. Plenty of burned material was collected, and the piece moved in, set in place, on some old bank and financial statements, ready for the next day's experiment. Around 8 the next morning, in memory of those Enron files, I lit the bank statements to start the experiment. A rather robust fire soon enveloped. As the fire grew, additional fuel had to be constantly added. More and more piles of brush was added to build a good base for the larger logs that would be added later in the day. All morning long and part of the afternoon, the fire was fed with more and more fuel, including brush, trimmings, and some furniture and door panels were also added. After all the piles of brush were finally consumed, entire loader buckets of larger logs were added. The inferno burned all throughout the day, reaching temperatures that could easily melt aluminum cans and aluminum gutters. The fire blazed throughout the night, bringing the temperatures high enough to make the wide flange beam glow red. The fire burned for over 24 hours, and the coals lasted for another full day. By midweek, the fire was cool enough to remove the test piece. The ashes were raked off, and the test piece lifted out for observation. The wire lath and fencing was clipped off, and the gypsum removed. For the most part, all the aluminum scrap was gone, with the exception of a few small blobs. The steel beam did not have any holes whatsoever. In fact, it was still quite solid and sound. The aluminum, concrete, drywall, diesel fuel, and building materials did not cause any intergranular melting. So, if the concrete, drywall, aluminum, and diesel fuel did not cause the intergranular melting and sulfidation, then some uncommon substance that is not normally found in buildings must have caused it. And that uncommon substance must have been inside the structure before their destruction. Most people cannot accept the implications of the science behind 9-11 and think I must be wrong. So if you think I'm wrong, prove me wrong by experiment. But remember, there may be a reason why diesel storage tanks don't look like Swiss cheese and why drywall is placed directly on steel stud framing and structural steel for fire insulation and a reason why those firewise professors were so perplexed. And even though the firewise professors, FEMA, Mr. Mackey and Dr. Greening all suggested that NIST should test and investigate to find the source of the sulfur. There is a reason why NIST ignored all their advice and never conducted any experiments or found that source of sulfur to solve this deepest of mysteries. Perhaps NIST knew the most logical cause of the sulfidation of the steel is from some type of thermitic reaction because it matches all other evidence such as the molten steel or iron flowing out the side of the tower well before its collapse. The iron spheroids found in the dust, which is a direct byproduct of a thermitic reaction. The NASA thermal images of the rubble piles indicating very high temperatures days after the event that can be caused by ongoing thermitic chemical reactions. And the high-tech explosive nanothermite found all through the dust. And, of course, the fact that the remarkable collapse, supposedly from a new phenomenon called thermal expansion due to an office fire, looks exactly like a controlled demolition. The murder of thousands on 9-11 wasn't considered a crime, and therefore never investigated as a crime, which may be why so much forensic evidence is ignored, such as the iron microspheres and the explosive nanothermite found in the dust, and that mysterious eutectic steel. Don't they deserve some justice?